O heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and filling all things, treasurer of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm very excited to be back. I've missed a Sunday, and then I know it's been like three weeks or something that we've been together. Now we're going to have a kind of a marathon, except for next week. I'm out of town next week, but after that, I hope we're going to get into every Sunday until Palm Sunday. And then if you saw the schedule that I sent out, hopefully we're going to uh, get one uh, day in after Pascha on uh, Thomas Sunday as well. And I, I laid out, I think, a rough... Uh, outline of what I hope our classes will be. It never seems to work out that way, but that's okay. Uh, As I was just telling John, we don't have an agenda in here, uh, you know, in terms of a curriculum that we have to to fulfill. So I'm happy to, you know, discuss all these topics and go from one tangent to another and mostly just enjoy our time together and and, uh, this, this conversation on the mother of God. So uh, with that, I wanted to, oh, I, actually there was, um, I, I was just thinking about this, this time we are in Lent, and um, it's going to be very apropos for us, because as we go into uh, the rest of the season of Lent, we, we listen to a lot of hymns in the church services, and I, I said that one of the, the, the greatest resources that we can ever use in order to speak about the relevance of the mother of God is the liturgy in the church, right? Because she doesn't have uh, heavy scriptural references. She is written about uh, quite extensively in, in patristic thought, but really it's the, the liturgical services that highlight the role of the mother of God in the life of uh, Christians and in the life of the church. So I, I would encourage you as you know, we're going through this season that you pay attention to these hymns uh, that are sung, and especially... On Fridays during Lent, we sing a, uh, a hymn that's, that's called the Akathist hymn. Uh, Akathist means not sitting. So uh, kathisma is a, a, is a setting or to sit. And then the A at the beginning is called an alpha privative. It's just a, a negator. It means the opposite of something. We have this in a lot of English words. Uh, you put an A at the beginning and it means the opposite of something. Alpha, what was the second part uh, alpha privative. Privative. Okay. privative. It's just that first little letter at the beginning. So Akathis just means a hymn that we sing while we're not sitting. And this hymn was composed by St. Romanos the Melodist. And it's broken up into, I think, 12 sections. And these 12 sections of uh, the hymn are composed of uh, what are called the Condacion and Ecos. And these are just Let's say a, a standard style of hymn. Think sonnet, right? English teachers could probably answer this. How many verses in a sonnet? Well, there's more than that. 14? 14. 14. I don't know. I was guessing. That's pretty close. It's, it's pretty close. And there's a, there's a certain structure that's associated with a sonnet, right? You can't just write any poem you want and call it a sonnet, right? It has to follow a certain structure. So a condacion and ecos, is, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a particular structure of a hymn. Um, and so whenever you see these, they'll follow this particular structure. And usually at the end, it it's, uh, ends with a refrain. So the end of all the refrains are rejoice, O bride unwedded. And then the, the people respond with that hymn. We actually also do these in every orthro service. There's a, a short condacion and ecos. We actually just do the, the opening portion to them during the orthro service instead of the whole uh, portion of the hymn. Uh, but they also follow this st- same structure with a little refrain at the end. So this, this hymn was uh, written by St. Romanos, who I believe 7th, 8th century, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful service. It's actually not originally part of Lent. So the Akathis was not originally part of Lent. It was added in uh, at a later time. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when. But uh, it's become a, a mainstream aspect of Lent. You think of the Lenten services and they're compline. They are pre-sanctified and they're the Akathist hymn, which happens on Friday. And, and the Akathis is divided up into these 12 sections. And then within those 12 sections, it's also divided up into uh, four sections. 
So each one of these four sections is sung during the first four weeks of Lent. So every Friday in the first four weeks of Lent, we'll sing one of these portions of the Akathis hymn. And then on the fifth week, we do the whole thing. So there'll be the service of the Akathist on the fifth week of Lent. Um, so during this, this, this whole period, we, we remember uh, Mary, her role in the salvific work of her son. And we're going to have a class, I think the last class before Palm Sunday, that we're going to talk about essentially roles Mary, I'm sorry, Mary's role in the uh, Passion narrative. Okay, so where she serves kind of that week leading up to uh, Christ's passion and resurrection and how the church really believes that she is with him along that entire path. You know, regardless of the fact that she isn't, she isn't mentioned uh, very often uh, scripturally, that she is essentially there along every uh, step of that journey uh, in that last week. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll talk about that in that, in that week uh, leading up to Holy Week. I think it's a, it'll be a really beautiful preamble to start seeing uh, the Mother of God uh, serving in this role. And then the last class that we'll do afterwards is the, the mother of God's uh, role in the modern church. So how modern saints have viewed her and spoken about her, uh, including, you know, some modern, modern saints in the, in the 20th century. So that's kind of our, our path that we're traveling, and we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to stick to this outline as much as possible. Um, any just other questions up front before we start talking about the Proto-Evangelium of James? I had a question, like, yeah. maybe preambling yeah. before we get into the program of William James. Yeah. So I remember last class, and forgive me if I'm, like, misremembering what exactly you said, but, mm-hmm. like, um, we talked about how there's some portions of it that are helpful for the life of the church and some portions that aren't as helpful for the life of the church. Yes, yeah. Um, and coming from a Protestant sola scriptura background, that feels like... Pushy uh, washy. You know, yeah, yeah, and so I guess... How, how does the church, I don't know what my question really is, but like... How do we decipher what is good and what isn't yes, good? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, I would, I would in, in a text like this, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. The, the, the text is probably middle, second century, up until, you know, somewhere early in the third century. We can't place it exactly. Our only way of really dating the text isn't by uh, existing manuscripts that we have of the text but rather other authors who have referenced it. So Origen uh, referenced it, Clement of Alexandria referenced it, so these, these early writers referenced it, so we know that it was around this period, late second century and onward. So for a text like this, you know, I would say what has been adopted into the church, you know, like actively, you read, you read hymns, you look at uh, feasts in the church, which we'll talk about that comes from... Uh, some of these writings, you read, uh, you, you see these feasts, and you're like, okay, these are things that, are, that you can take away. Whereas other things, and we mentioned this uh, other moment, right, this little Zen moment of uh, time freezing, which it's kind of cool, but it's, it's not been adopted in any way, right? You're not, there's no hymnography that says, and when you were born, the whole universe, you know, Froze in place as it worshipped, you know, there, there's nothing that's ever been adopted there. So I, I would say that, one, there's nothing doctrinal that's really being uh, developed in this text. So I wouldn't worry about any doctrinal things that are in here. And then with everything else, there's a, I hate to, I hate to be a little bit relative with this, but is it helpful for you? Okay. Is it helpful for you? And if it's not, then that's okay. We don't need it. Okay. And let me let me bring up a, a, a another thing that's a little controversial. Um, has anybody heard of toll houses? All right. So toll houses are, let's say, this teaching that exists in the church on what happens to the soul after death. And there have been some saints that have taught that the, the soul goes through these series of toll houses in which they are confronted with demons who tell them, you know, these are the sins that you've committed in your life. Let's say uh, this is a rough idea of what this, this is. And this is taught, I wouldn't say actively, it's not doctrinal, it's not dogmatic, 
but it has some place in the life of the church um, for you know certain people. It's not at all helpful for me. But I wouldn't say that it's not helpful for other people. Is it like a purgatory where you're purged of those sins that you've had? Yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of that idea that's associated with a, a little bit. Um, it's not explicitly like a purgatory. Um, again, I, I, you know, I've read a little bit about it. You, read, you, you hear about it because there, there are many circles, especially some monastic circles where, you'll, where you will hear about it more. But I wouldn't take any of it to be doctrinal. So if it's not helpful, you can throw it out. And so that seems a little weird from like the sola scriptura realm where you're just like, well, everything here is what I got to believe and I got to keep it all. The church is not like that. Um, and we, we talked about this before that, you know, the, the, the life of the church puts things in order of what's helpful, right? We talked about the gospels. Not all the gospel is read in church. We, and then there are the epistles. Not all the epistles are read in the church. Uh, and then there are certain writings in the life of the church that are elevated above others, right? We commemorate, for example, the great hierarchs of the church. So Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and John Chrysostom. Most of the things that they write are good. I mean, you can look at them and rely on them and be like, okay, this is the theology of the church. But then you might read uh, something else by a later author and be like, oh, this, this doesn't feel right to me. And that's totally fine. Again, all of these things should be understood within, you know, within relationship and within a prayerful life uh, of the church that's rooted in you know, the sacraments. So if you're living liturgically, if you're living in the life of the church, then what, what is, is it St. Paul or St. Peter says that, that nothing is unavailable to you? Does anybody remember the exact verse? Is it Paul? Is it Paul? Nothing, nothing is unlawful, nothing is unlawful yeah. but some things aren't good for you. Yeah. Right? What is the verse? Oh, I don't know the verse. Oh. It's like, yeah, all things are permissible, but not all things are... Uh, beneficial. beneficial. Right? Not everything is edifying. So if something is edifying for you, then great. Like, let it build up your uh, spiritual life. But if it's not edifying, and if it's edifying for somebody else, you don't have to take that as, you know, some knock against you or the other person. Then just, you know, this just isn't beneficial for me. Right? Um, so I, I, that, that, that might be a little bit hard to accept in a way, but um, I, would only, I would just put it in that context of relationship in the church. Is that helpful? Yeah. Ish? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, I think it's just... It's just a worldview shift. It's a, it's a it's total paradigm shift, for sure. It's a, I think it's a total paradigm shift. Um, it, on one side, I, I say this a lot, and I, I, I kind of jokingly mean it, but not really... Um, that, you know, we're a disaster, right? And I, I mean that jokingly, but, you know, the, the, the theology of the church is, is, is firm. We can't just throw things out. We can't, we can't throw out the music in the church, the hymns of the church. We can't throw out, you know, how we do things and participate in the life of the church. But then at the same time, we have to say, well, we're in relationship with these things. And... You know, we, we, we take what is beneficial to us. So when I say that we're a disaster, like we can just be all over the place, right? Personally and in, and in the life of the church. I think about this, you know, just like in the hierarchy of the church. Our bishop, I don't know if everyone knows, but our bishop, Metropolitan Isaiah, just resigned last week. And um, so we don't have a metropolitan right now. We have a, a, a locum tenens who's Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago, if you, if you heard that. Uh, during the service today. And I talked to Bishop Constantine. I was like, so when do you think you'll get elected to be the next Metropolitan? He goes, I don't even know if I would be the Metropolitan. I'm like, you better be. Um, he goes, you know, sometimes the church is such a disaster that I don't even know what's going to happen. Um, and there's, there, honestly, for me, there's a little bit of comfort in that, right? Because we, we live in like, we live in this chaos and somehow the Holy Spirit works through this chaos and things work out. Um, it, feels, it feels more comfortable than being in a Stepford church. Right, you know, Stepford Wives, right? Everything's yeah. in a box. Everything, has Everything just looks clean and well ordered. I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I want to be in a Stepford <laughs> church. I, I kind of like the chaos a little bit. Um, yeah, a little bit. There's a, there's an aspect of the unpredictable. It's like when when things are unpredictable, that's where where God can work. I don't know if that's right or not, but 
<laughs> oh, I'm, I'm too old or not old? Too young. Too young? I know about the Stepford Wives. <laughs> um, it's, okay. it's been a mess since Genesis. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of thrive in the mess, too, so I appreciate it. Um, so, I, yeah, so I was just thinking about that and, and the Metropolitan Isaiah always like to say that their proof of the Holy Spirit working in the church is that we're still around after all this time. So I, I always deeply appreciated that. So, I mean, tying that back maybe to, to where we are with these readings, these readings, very, very few readings were actively condemned by the church. There were some. There were some. Uh, I was actually just reading about uh, some this week because we were talking about the term uh, ever virgin. If you remember that in the last class, so I, I wanted to make sure that I looked into that. And ever virgin is brought up in the fifth ecumenical council. And it's not, let's say, dogmatized in the fifth ecumenical council. It just uses it as a title. So in one of the pronouncements in the fifth ecumenical council, it says, and if, if anybody denies that Christ is born of the ever virgin Mary and... Da, 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 da. I forget what the exact line is, but that's how the line ever virgin is used. So it, it's, it doesn't have any like dogmatized, you know, if you do not believe that Mary is ever virgin, then you are anathematized. It doesn't say anywhere something like that. It just uses it in the context of a title associated with Mary uh, in those pronouncements. But, but one of the, the tenets of the Fifth Ecumenical Council is it rejects uh, three texts that are called the three chapters. And so the, the whole, the whole uh, proceedings basically have these ten lines that, sit, that support the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. And then it has like three lines that reject these specific writings. Um, but it's pretty rare that this happens in the church, that writings are, are directly rejected by, you know, an ecumenical council or, or a, a church or anything like that. Rather, we have uh, texts like this one, the Proto-Evangelium of James, um, that we consider to be apocryphal literature, right? So before the fourth century, there was no... Uh, a canon of scripture. People were just reading a whole bunch of books. And uh, it wasn't, yeah, books, sorry, scrolls, you're right. Yeah, they were reading a whole bunch of scrolls. And um, at one point, people were reading all kinds of scrolls and the church had to say, okay, well, these books are good and these books aren't so good. They're just not as good. So we're just gonna say, okay, these 27 books are good. And put those to the side and say, these are the good books. And then the other ones, they weren't put into the bad category. They just weren't put into the, these are good all the time category. Does that make sense? So a work like the Proto-Evangelium of James, everybody knew it, right? It's referenced many, many times. Uh, if you read the little header uh, beforehand, there's over 200 surviving manuscripts of the Proto-Evangelium of James. That's a lot. That's a lot of manuscripts. Um, so it was, it was widely published. It was widely uh, not published. Feathered, penned, something like that. I'm just messing. It was widely distributed, widely, widely disseminated early, very early on in the church. Um, and a lot of people knew about it. Now, uh, yeah, Kevin? Did, um, were there some books that were considered like this is there are, very, there are very few that are, that are actively <clears throat> denounced. One, one of them actually is uh, the infancy gospel of Thomas. So this is, is another... Is the Vinci Code gospel of Thomas? Do you remember that book, movie? I think so. Yeah, he talks... Uh, like it felt like the main text that he... The, the author of okay. the original book referenced was the gospel of Thomas. I, th I think I do remember that, was like, that yeah. That like a big... Yeah. And that was that was tossed for really good reasons. Yes, I, I have I have a couple of notes on it actually. Um, so were they were they like intentionally tossed like through counsel or something? No, but they just weren't good for reading. So you imagine like people are reading and they're like, oh, you know, all these things happened, and then the priests and bishops are like, no, 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 this didn't happen. You need to stop reading it. But so there was there are some. There's not that. Yeah. So it's it's. 
the, the texts that, that uh, you know, gain traction are the ones that were actively denounced like these three chapters for the Fifth Ecumenical Council. They had wide distribution, so they were actively denounced by an ecumenical council. Um, but you know, these, these earlier ones, uh, they were not like actively denounced. They just never gained traction, right? The church was, never accepted them, um, and so they just like kind of threw them out. Yeah, yeah. The Proto-Evangelion uh, is written by... Uh, Aren't there like two big Jameses, like James the Greater and Lesser? Yeah, so this one's uh, it's attributed to uh, James, the brother of the Lord, so the son of Joseph. Okay. Now, again, all evidence is really pointing to an, a later author, right? Oh. In, in other words, the author had some knowledge of the of the uh, the Nativity Gospel of, uh, especially of Luke, right? So he had some some knowledge of this. And, you know, they look at writing styles and things like that, and, and it's, it's pretty clear that it's second century or later. So how come it, it is still attributed to James, the brother? You know, it finishes that way. It finishes that way, right? The last line of the text says, Now I, James, who wrote this history, when a tumult arose in Jerusalem on the death of Herod, withdrew into the wilderness until the tumult in Jerusalem ceased. And I will praise the Lord who gave me the, the wisdom to write this history. Grace shall be all those who fear the Lord. So, you know, he, he signs himself as the author. And, and what we have to remember is um, this is quite a common theme that we come up with in the church is what, what truth are we looking for? And do we have to rewrite based off of what scholarly evidence has told us about who could have written, you know, this, this story? Was it James, brother of the Lord? Probably not. Right. But we take that the author is writing it, let's say, in the spirit of James. He's taking on this mantle of James and writing it in that context. So, or would it have been, or could it have been already tradition? That yeah, so that's... James said these things, he taught, like, no, right. these people taught that. To this yeah, and, and we'll, we'll kind of speak about that a little bit. That, that Remember, there's a lot that happens in the first 200 years of the church. Mm-hmm. And most of it's not written down. It exists through oral tradition. St. Paul speaks about that as well. Um, and John, St. John does as well, right? If, if I were to write down all of the acts that Christ did in his lifetime, there would not be enough uh, books, scrolls. In the, sorry, I'm picking on you. There would be, not be enough uh, uh, books in the, in the world to contain everything that he did. So there, there was some kind of you know, strong oral tradition that existed at the time as well. So we, we take those things into mind and, and um, you know, we, we, again, keep what's beneficial. And it was called, I, I think the title Proto-Evangelium of James is a newer title. I don't think they, you know, called it this, you know, a thousand years ago. I think that's a, that's a more recent uh, a scholarly attribution, but pretty clear that it wasn't written in the first century. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I, we're, we're kind of bumping up against these, uh, you know, these types of texts, these parabiblical texts, uh, uh, this apocryphal literature. And uh, I, I think it's important for us to talk about what apocryphal literature is. Uh, just really briefly, most of them are going to surround the uh, in infancy or youth period of Christ. Okay? Because if we look at the Gospels themselves... They talk about really the adult life of Christ. Okay, there's a very, very brief intros uh, into the nativity of Christ, but most of it's about the adult life of Christ. And then at one point when he's what, 12, 14, and he goes into Jerusalem? 12. So we have this very, you know, brief insight. And then the rest of it is, is just about a three year period. Okay, it's really just a three year period that we're looking at. And uh, so the, these writings are, they're, they're meant to be well-intentioned. They're meant to fill in these gaps in the story, okay? And these gaps in the story, uh, of, of course, are going to be based off of an oral tradition that existed in the church, okay? So people telling stories to each other, and then at one point, they, these, these traditions get written down. And, and you know, they, they develop, and, and portions of the story uh, get established, and I mean, you know, all you all know how stories work, 
right? You've probably told the same stories hundreds and hundreds of times, and, you know, there's the core of it that stays the same, but then there's all, you know, the frills of it that wind up changing a little bit, right? So, so we would look at these apocryphal uh, works as uh, literature that's telling these oral traditions of the church. Now, we brought up uh, already the, this infancy gospel of Thomas, and it's been completely thrown out. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, crazy if you've re- read it. Um, so there's portions of it like Christ as a kid, like playing on the playground, basically. And another kid steals his soccer ball, imagine, and he casts the other kid down and makes him blind. Whoa. Yep, that's not, that's not an exaggeration. So he makes another kid blind because he steals his soccer ball. You're like, ah, you know, now you know why that one's been thrown out, right? Um, and uh, some other crazy things like that, like he, he makes somebody else sick and then he heals them. And then, you know, I don't know, a gardener falls down and breaks his, breaks his ankle and he heals, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the, the funniest one is, yeah, he, he, he makes the other kid on the playground blind that because... That sounds a lot like somebody who... Is a little said, vindictive. If I had these God powers, I would get all these people. Right, <laughs> right, right. So, so the, the, there are those early Gospels that, that exist, and for obvious reasons, they were tossed out. Right? So they were tossed out. Um, but this, this work gained a lot of traction. Um, one, it, it really gives credence to the early veneration and recognition of Mary within the life of the church. Right? I mean, this whole story is essentially focused on her uh, conception, her birth, and then her preparation to give birth to Christ. So this whole story is about Mary. So it, it, it's very clear that this is directing us uh, uh, and, or, or highlighting the, the aspects and the importance of Mary in the early life of the church. And we should also look in the, at these texts in a particular standpoint, Right? So we have the, the story aspect, right? So people want this story. But then we have to ask the question a little bit of why do you think people wrote this story down? It's good. That's, yeah, that's valid, yeah. Do you want the historian on this? Sure. Yeah, so one interpretation is uh, there's a heresy, very rampant, docentism. Yep. And... Everything that's being said about Mary in this, uh, all these experiences, it's just a, not just a slap, but it's a slam of docetism. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would I would highlight that. Yes, that um, you know there's heresies going around. There's a lot that happened in these first few centuries. Uh, so th- there's a cont- there's a lot of contention around Mary, and the contention around Mary is basically asking the question of who is Christ. Right? So these stories seek to answer that question. Yeah, Asa. Sorry, I just missed that. Uh, the, a lot of discrepancy around Mary, that was ancient discrepancy. Like, yeah, yeah. That this was pinned. Yeah, yeah. People were fighting about it. Oh, yeah, there. for sure, for sure. Well, I, I, I don't know if fighting is the right word, but there was, there was contention about who Jesus Christ was. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah. People didn't know who Jesus Christ was. And so how do you hurt somebody? You attack their mom. I mean, I, again, kind of jokingly, but true, right? Yeah, I mean, if I made fun of your mom, you would not be happy. But, I mean, in, 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 uh, in the life of the church, this is also what happened. People who were attacking Christ were also attacking his mother. Okay? And because by attacking uh, the mother of God, you directly attack who Christ is. Right? If you, if you can't say that Mary is the mother of God, then you reject the incarnation. You reject uh, that, that Christ is, is born as 100% man and 100% God. So it's a, it's a really important theological statement that we say Mary is the mother of God. So these, these early, uh, th- these stories were meant to confront those contentions. Okay, so there were certainly uh, early contentions in the church. And then along with that, there was a desire to see Mary and Christ also in the context of the Old Testament. 
Okay? We talked about last time how Mary ful- fulfills all of these Old Testament <laughs> archetypes. You know, specific things like she's the ark, she's the temple, uh, she was the ladder, she was all of these different uh, uh, characteristics. So there's a desire to, to, to put her and Christ in the context of the Old Testament. And if you read in this writing, this is like, reads 100% Old Testament here, right? So if you remember everything that we read in here, this is reading um, 100% uh, Old Testament, that it's addre- addressing lots of these problems from the Old Testament. So um, I, I kind of just want to uh, go through here and talk about some of the highlights. Um, if there's any notes that, that you all made, something that you want to uh, bring up, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to stop and go wherever. I took lots and lots of notes as I, as I worked myself through here. I only pulled out some highlights. Every one of those uh, little scriptural references I wanted to go look up and, and look up in context because people who were writing in the first centuries knew their scripture. Especially if they were Jews, they knew their Old Testament. So there's lots of Old Testament references in here, especially here in the beginning uh, with a parallel story with Samuel. So I don't know if you picked up on that. I only picked up on it from the references as I looked through the references. Um, but it, it winds up winds up being a pretty interesting. So Samuel. Yeah, so the birth of Samuel. Because Samuel's uh, mother is in a similar situation to Mary's mother. Right? She's without child and she's basically shunned by the people. And, um, you know, she's in great despair, which is kind of what the first few pages are about this. And then uh, Samuel's mother then offers and says, well, if you allow me to have a child, I will dedicate this child to the temple. I will dedicate this child to God. So that's what it says in Samuel. Really, you can just read. I think it's just uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. That's all you need to read. I think that's what it was. Um, if you just read that, begin, yep, just 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, and you'll get that whole story. And it's really a very close parallel to the, to the story of Mary here. I mean, the same verses are used uh, that are used in Samuel, so there's, there's a direct parallel that's there. All right, so in this text, we learn a few things. One, and, and you, you'll have to help me out here, outside of the Orthodox and Catholic Church, is there knowledge of the names Joachim and Anna? No? Okay, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but this is where the, the, the parenthood, the parentage of, of Mary comes from. So we know their names as, as Joachim and Anna. And they have a, a story that's you know, parallel to some of the patriarchs of old, especially Abraham and Sarah, right? They're in their old, and then Elizabeth and Zechariah, which we, which we will uh, you know, see a little bit later on. So Joachim and Anna are without child, uh, Joachim is, is an important person somehow in, in, in the life of the church. And they're both very sad over the fact that uh, they cannot have uh, children. And I think he goes out and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And he says, I shall not go down either for food or for drink until the Lord my God visits me. And prayer shall instead be my food and drink. So they're, they're desperate to, to have a child because it was important, right, to, to, to progress the human race because why, why were uh, Jews told to uh, multiply so that they could bring about the Messiah, right? Part of the reason for marriage and having children was to bring about the Messiah. Well, here, a couple in old age, they desire to have children, and their children, her, their daughter, is going to bring forth the Messiah. And so I actually really love this line. I thought it was really funny. Joachim goes out and he disappears for 40 days and 40 nights. And then how does Anna respond? Does anybody remember? He's gone. Now, if your husband leaves for 40 days and 40 nights, what are you going to say? Bewails her I bewail my, my widowhood and bewail my childlessness. I mean, it, I, it's just kind of a little bit amusing to me that, you know, this is a typical man thing, right? They just go out and disappear for 40 days. <laughs> and the woman's like, where did he go? Because he's dead. Because he's yeah. dead, right. I mean, in those days and age, it was a pretty good assumption he'd be dead. Right, right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
So I, I just thought that was a great little line right there. It's just an aside. I, I, like, I like to think that ancient authors had some, some uh, uh, good senses of humor, and, and sometimes we should read them in that context as well, but that's where my, my, my mind went first. So uh, as we go along, it really starts to delve into this story of Samuel. And in the, in the life of Samuel, I think it's Samuel's mother. I can't remember. Judith? No. Oh, that's the, that's the servant. Uh, Samuel's um, mother's sister winds up mocking her for not being able to have children. And we actually see the same thing here. It says uh, that, and this is even worse, Anna's maidservant winds up mocking her. And uh, she says, why should I curse you because you have not listened to me? The Lord God has shut up your womb to give you no fruit in Israel. This is a pretty harsh thing for a, a, you know, a servant to say um, uh, to her, you know, her master. And so Anna is, of course, very sad, and she, she prays to the Lord God, and she says, Bless me and hear my prayer, as thou didst bless the womb of Sarah, and gavest her a son Isaac. So she's you know, directly referencing uh, Abraham and uh, Sarah here. And then she, she bemoans and, and, and looks to creation. She sits under a laurel tree, which is a bay tree, and she sees a nest of sparrows. So she even witnesses the fact that creation is having children, but she's unable to have children. And I, I find this next uh, set of verses very interesting. She has these series of woes. And I don't know if this is real or not, but... It almost seemed like this was a, a reverse of creation, the way she was saying these woes. Mm-hmm. So she says, woe is me to what am I likened? I am not likened to the birds of heaven. I am not likened to the unreasoning animals. I am not likened to the beasts of the earth. I am not likened to the waters. I am not likened to the earth. So it's kind of this reverse of how creation happens, right? Earth, waters, um, and beasts, and the birds of the sky. And this is in the opposite direction. So I I don't know if that's what's going on, but I just, as I read each one of those, it felt like it was this reverse of creation. But what's great is that immediately after this, Immediately afterwards, an angel of the Lord came to her. And when we, when we hear an angel of the Lord, a lot of times we associate an angel of the Lord with Christ, a pre-incarnate Christ. When you see the, the words angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, this is usually referencing a pre-incarnate Christ. So you can imagine her grandson coming to visit her at this point, right? Anna, Anna, the Lord has heard your prayer. You shall conceive and bear, and your offspring shall be spoken of in the whole world. And Anna said, As the Lord my God lives, if I bear a child, whether male or female, I will bring it as a gift to the Lord my God, and it shall serve him all the days of its life. So this is almost a direct quote from 1 Samuel. She says almost exactly the same thing about Samuel. Okay? So uh, Joachim kind of receives the same message when he's out uh, in the field. And he comes back, and later on she winds up uh, discovering that she's pregnant, that she's with child. And it doesn't say too much about, uh, you know, the birth of Mary, only that they, they offered up gifts in the temple. And she uses this language that's very similar to what Mary says about herself. So Anna said, my soul is magnified this day, right, which is very similar to the Magnificat uh, that Mary says. And she laid it down, and when the days were fulfilled, Anna purified herself according to the, the, the law of the temple. And then it, it happens really quick now. Does anybody remember, like, these early days from the reading of, of Mary? Like, how, what are the, the first couple years of Mary's life like? Really weird. That's so hard. Talking about like, Mary's childhood? I mean, like, before she goes to the temple. Yeah, like, the whole, like, putting her in a room and being uh-huh. kind of holy and people come visit her and they're like, you're not going to have a life like a normal kid. You're going right. to we'll bring, bring children, children to yeah. play with you, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. So she's set apart, right? She's set apart. When does she walk? 
Like six months. Six months. She walks when she's six months old. She walks seven steps. Okay? So th- this whole thing is, again, put this into context. This isn't like, oh, you know, we need to believe this and this is what happened. Just we're, we're setting up the narrative and who, who Mary is. She's being prepared to receive Christ. That's this whole early part of her life. And just like the temple that was built, it was made to be a pure temple, right? Everything in the temple had to be pure. So she was being prepared uh, in this same way. So um, we, we, we read this early part of the narrative, and she's, she just lives in, in a, you know, a clean home, and only uh, virgins are allowed to come and play with her. Uh, she's very precocious. She walks early. And uh, we see, finally, that when she's three years old, she's finally brought to the temple. Okay? Now, this entry of the mother of God in the temple actually becomes one of the 12 great feasts of the church. Okay? So this feast is a big deal in the life of the church. And this is the only place that it's referenced. So this is kind of an aspect of writings like this that they're non-scriptural. They come from an apocryphal piece of literature. I mean, again, uh, coexistent with an oral tradition in the church, uh, but that has become a feast day of the church, a very, very big feast day of the church, right? So it's in November 21st, I think, November 20th, 21st, yeah. Can you recap again why she was being treated this way? In order for just her to maintain her purity, Yep. But not every girl. No, 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 no. But the parents just like, yeah. Like, parents just were like super dope, super excited. Yeah. Gave a bunch of gifts to the whole community and said, "We're so stoked. We're gonna set this child aside." Yep. Because before she was born, they promised to offer her up to God. So they yeah. they offer her from this young age um, to the temple, basically to God. And so when she's three years old, they finally take her to the temple. And uh, the story is that they, they set her on the steps, and she, she was so focused on God that as she entered the, table, the temple, she didn't turn back once to look at her parents. Because she was so focused as a three-year-old, right? I mean, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old, uh, and he's just like runs up and down the aisles of the church. Um, but he, he, she was so focused that her eyes were fixed on God and that she knew from even such a young age essentially what her duty was in a way. And so she goes into the church without ever turning back. Is this Zechariah, the high priest, the same as... It is. Yes, yes. So this is supposed to be the same Zacharias as the father of John the Baptist, which we read about later on, actually, because there's one point where it says... Um, sometimes, sometimes the names are so similar. Nope. I was like, is that the same? Yeah, no, it says at one point where they, were, they went to consult Zechariah, but he, was, he couldn't speak. He was dumb. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And that's when John the Baptist is born. So he's struck dumb at that point. So um, Mary enters the temple, and she lives in the temple for about 10 years, you know, until she uh, uh, physically matures. And during this time, now we have to to remember what the temple was at this point. It's not like St. Spiridon. It's a huge structure, right? So there's the Holy of Holies, which is, you know, the smallest portion of it. But then there's an outer temple. There's like a huge courtyard. There's... You know, this big area, when, when we talk about Christ going up and, and upending the, the money changers' tables, it's not like there were 10 of them. I mean, there's a massive courtyard, okay? If, you, if you've been to Jerusalem or you've seen pictures of, you know, the Temple Mount, it's a very, very large place. So when we say that Mary was in the temple, she was in this huge place, and there were a lot of people that lived there, right? You've got a big temple, and there's people that sweep, there's people that clean, there's people that fill the oil lamps, there's people that, you know, take care of the animals, right? Because there were animals that were always continually coming in for the sacrifices. So it was a huge place. So it, it, it's not really unreasonable for a little girl to have lived there, okay? And there were these temple virgins that cared for certain aspects of the temple, so she, she comes to age after 10 years, and during this period of time, she, we, she is you know, nurtured essentially by 
the temple life and by angels who are ministering to her uh, as, a, as a, a young girl. And at this point then, when she's here, is 12 years old, she comes of age and she has to leave the temple. Okay? And so what they do is they say, uh, according to the reading, they, they cast lots in order to find out who will take care of Mary. And they bring all the righteous men, essentially, of Israel out. And they give them each a rod. Okay, this is very reminiscent of Aaron and the rod that buds forth. And when Joseph takes the rod, what happens? A dove comes out and rests on his head. Right? I wouldn't want a dove resting on my head for too long. But a dove comes out and rests on it, uh, his head. And so Joseph is uh, recognized as the one who's going to be taking care of, uh, of Mary. And he's an old man, right? He's an old man. He has his own kids. And this is a young girl, you know, a 12-year-old. So, you know, an old man and a 12-year-old, you can, you can see the relationship already, that he's caring for this young girl and helping her in her, you know, raising her up and just caring for her until what he would think is the time where she will become married to someone, right? You're just thinking this from, from the perspective of, uh, you know, a Jew at the time. And so... The, the, next, the next part of this reading is really, really interesting. So when Mary leaves the temple, she still actively participates in certain aspects of the life of the temple. And one of those things is that they're making a new veil for the temple of the Lord. Okay, So the veil, imagine like where our, our beautiful gate is, where the altar is. Instead of the altar doors, they would have a big veil. And it, it would have been huge, right? The, the gate was really, really tall. Like, I don't know, 30, 40 feet tall. And it was a big curtain that would have hung down. And that was uh, the veil of the temple. And the priest remembered Mary and basically asks Mary to sew this veil for the temple. And um, there are different portions to this veil and the, and the portion that falls to Mary to uh, sew up is the pure purple and scarlet. So ancient world, what does purple represent? Royalty. Royalty. Okay. So she's being asked to, um, to sew up the, the curtain. Oh, and here's the line. And at that time, Zacharias became dumb. So Zacharias, his wife, Elizabeth, is now pregnant with John the Baptist. Okay? So Zacharias is dumb, and Samuel takes the place of Zacharias. And Mary is now spinning the thread for uh, the veil of the curtain. And this next portion, then, is uh, the Annunciation. And in the Annunciation, we, we kind of see it as this twofold uh, story, which is a little bit... Um, uncommon for most people who know the story of the Annunciation. But this, this two-folded story is highlighted in a lot of iconography and hymnography of the church. So the first part of the story, um, it, well, if you know the story of the Annunciation, do you know where Gabriel meets Mary? And it's in the temple. Mm-hmm. But that's... That's, the, that's not the common story, but that is what happens in this text. So the common story is that she's just in the temple. She's somewhere, but it's not specific at all. But in this story, uh, the first part is she's approached by Gabriel at a well. Okay? Asa? Yeah, is this uh, the, the veil in the iconography here? Because I was looking at the iconography of the Annunciation, and there's, it's like, essentially it was representing Mary's house and uh, Elizabeth's house, and, uh -huh. like, and there's a, a curtain. No, not the quite. That's, like, that's, that? that's, a, that's a stylistic. They, they rarely would draw roofs. They would draw fabric roofs, stylistically in iconography. Okay. Um, it's like connecting the two houses also. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a stylistic connection. Uh, okay. I, I don't know if there's a, another meaning to it, but... But very often in iconography, you'll see fabric roofs okay. instead of like a you know hard topped roof. I don't I don't actually know what that's 
if it represents anything or it's just some stylistic choice. But we'll, we'll talk about this, the veil here in a second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, the angel meets Mary at a well. Okay? And again, you see this a lot in iconography. And she... And this is where we have the line from the archangel, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And she looked around on the right and on the left to see whence his voice came, and trembling she went to her house and put down the pitcher and took the purple and sat down on her seat and drew it out. So she's drawing out the the purple thread of this fabric. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before her and said, Do not fear, Mary, for you have found grace before the Lord of all things and shall conceive of his word. When she heard this, she doubted in herself and said, Shall I conceive of the Lord, the living God, and bear as every woman bears? And the angel of the Lord came and said to her, Not so, Mary, for a power of the Lord shall overshadow you. Wherefore, also that holy thing which is born of you shall be called the Son of the Highest. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord before him. Be it to me according to your word." So there's this part where she's at the well and she uh, encounters the angel. Now, let's just think about wells. What else happens at wells? Oh, the spouse. spouse. The spouse. Who, what spouse, who meets their spouse at a well? Okay. Moses. Moses. Fotini. Fotini. All right. Uh, the woman at the well, the... The Samaritan woman, who we don't actually have her name in scripture, but the church knows her name is Fotini. She meets Christ at the well. So people in, in scripture meet their, the, uh, let's say their spouse at the well. Okay, they meet their spouse at the well. And so here, uh, Mary meets the angel and, you know, essentially meets the Holy Spirit at the well. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon her and she conceives. Now, at the same time, it says on this next line, and she made ready the purple and the scarlet and brought them to the priest. So she has this um, uh, thread that she's been weaving this whole time. And there's a direct parallel here. Okay, so she's weaving this uh, garment that's going to become the veil of the temple. Right? And it's purple, so it's representing Christ. Now, at the same time she's weaving this veil of the temple, what is she also doing in her womb? Weaving. That's exactly it. (laughs) She's weaving the body of Christ in her womb. So there's there's a direct parallel here. Now, the veil of the temple, does that phrase remind you of anything? She wove the veil of the temple that was rent asunder when Christ dies on the cross. So she, she is the one who creates that veil that winds up being torn when Christ dies on the cross. Uh, so a direct connection there. And um, I mean, she also, she is also torn, right? And because this is what Simeon says to her. Right? That you, you, you will have a knife in your heart. Right? So this is also a, a direct parallel. She is the veil. And she is torn in two when her son dies on the cross. But then also in this real way of the, you know, the veil that she wove in the temple is also torn asunder when Christ dies on the cross. So really, I mean, really powerful imagery there. Yeah. It's just really, so when I uh, often would talk with college students, one of the issues was Old Testament and New Testament, and they feel like two different things, two different gods. It just feels like they have some place. So it's like such a break between the Testaments. She really is meant to be, yeah. Yeah, and I think like this story is meant to highlight that as well. Like she has her foot in both worlds, and she is this transition point to the New Testament, right? And, and, and we can kind of contrast it a little bit with like John the Baptist, who seems very, you know, anchored in the Old Testament. Yeah. And he, he paves the way, right? That's his name, Prodromos, the, 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 
the one who goes before on the road. He paves the way for the New Testament, but he still feels very Old Testamenty, right? He is uh, uh, Elias. Um, but Mary really does seem to have her foot in both realms. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, now we, we enter into a little bit of the story that we know. She, she becomes pregnant, and she goes and lives with Elizabeth, right, her cousin. And when she's 16, year old, she, and she's 16 when all of this occurs. Uh, now, with all of this, we also have a, a strong comparison of uh, the mother of God to Eve, okay, where Christ is the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve, and on this, uh, this next line, which is 13.1, it says, Now when she was in her sixth month, behold, Joseph came from his building and entered his house and found her with child. So scandal, right? And he smote his face, threw himself down on sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look towards the Lord my God? What prayer shall I offer for her? For I received her as a virgin out of the temple of the Lord my God, and I have not protected her. Who has deceived me? Who has done this evil in my house and defiled her? Has the story of Adam been repeated in me? For as Adam was absent in the hour of his prayer, and the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her and defiled her, so also has it happened to me. So there's this connection to the Old Testament. Um, You know, we like to blame Eve, but there's also this understanding that Adam left Eve alone. Okay? And by Adam leaving Eve alone... Um, essentially gave her up and was, was not there when she needed him. Okay, so the fault is with Adam before it's with Eve, uh, kind of in this context. So he's blaming himself and, and saying, you know, have I committed the same sin, essentially, that Adam did by leaving Eve? Because only when they were together were they, were they really a united person. And so he, you know, he's a righteous man, and Joseph doesn't want to expose Mary or, you know, uh, uh, throw her out of the temple. And so he, he aims to put her away. And we know this story again from, from Luke that uh, he, he has a visitation from an angel and, you know, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't cast Mary away or, or put her away silently. And of course, now that she's pregnant, everybody else is worried that he got her pregnant. So they're all kind of scandalized by the fact that that she's pregnant. They think that he did it. And they also accost Mary. They say, you know, you were brought up in the Holy of Holies. You received food from the hands of angels. You heard the hymns of praise and danced before them. Why have you done this? And so she feels accosted by this, of course, and she weeps. And... Now, what's, what's really interesting after this, and this is kind of another Old Testament co- uh, connection, is that when a woman was found to be with child or thought to have committed adultery, they actually had a test for this. And they gave them, and this comes from Numbers. So in Numbers, they would give uh, the woman bitter water, which if you read it in the context of Numbers, it's Numbers uh, 5. If you go read this in Numbers 5, they basically poison the woman. And if she's not affected by the poison, then she's innocent. But if she is affected by the poison, then she's guilty. Okay? So they give this... She's a witch. And this is... This is directly from Numbers 5. So you can read about that one in Numbers 5. It's called called the water of conviction. The water of conviction. And they give it to her and they give it to Joseph and neither one of them gets sick. So they're like, this is a miracle of the Lord God and we're not going to question it. So kind of another great uh, Old Testament connection there. This also, you know, gives us uh, some information about the author that the author had knowledge of Jewish practices also. Okay, so there was some kind of connection and knowledge of, uh, of Jewish practices. So maybe this was a, you know, a Jewish convert. We don't know. Um, so she winds up not uh, becoming sick, and then uh, so they know every they, they know it's a righteous birth essentially, and from there we go back into uh, the common narrative we know, and would they, would they have just thought like, I mean, they don't know any different like there's one way to make a baby, 
Do you think they were? I have no well, idea. I, it, I mean, just... here it says, here it says, and all the people marveled because the water had not revealed any sin in them. And the high priest said, if the Lord God has not made manifest your sins, neither do I condemn you. So they're just like, they're like, God they're made. like, you didn't know a man and you didn't know Mary. You're with child. God doesn't condemn you. I don't condemn you. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So they, they release him. And so now we go into, you know, the nativity narrative of Christ. And in this, as they're, as they're going along, um, this is where the, the first reference to a cave comes from. Again, in the New Testament, we see no references of a cave. Okay, there's just a manger. Uh, but this is where the reference to a cave comes from. Okay, so from this writing and, uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the oral tradition of the church. And then, you know, Christ is born and we have this really goofy uh, but kind of fun little time freezes uh, paragraph. Again, okay, it's, it's fun to read. I looked at the flow of the river and saw the mouths of the kids over it and they did not drink. And then all at once, everything went on its course again. So time froze and then it starts again. Again, you know, nothing has ever made it into hymnography or iconography in, in a verse like this. So we just kind of say, okay, it's kind of fun, but... We don't need it. Yeah, but theologically, that, that, that really resonates because Kairos is now coming into Kronos. Yeah, that yeah. That makes perfect sense for huh. Yeah, I mean, it's great. Like I said, if, if, if it's good, it's good, but it's not like some kind of dogma of the church that and time froze. Like I said, I don't know any hymnography where it's made, where it's made, in, made its way into hymnography. So if it's good, great, but yeah, we don't, it's not something that's actively taught, let's or, say. Uh, so it's each their own. Yeah, I, I mean, that's why I, 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 I want to be careful about the idea of relativism, right? Like, it's not just so we get to do whatever we want. Right. But if the church is, doesn't have a strong pronouncement on it, and it's beneficial for you to think about it in a certain way, then great. But you shouldn't be, you know, preaching it from the rooftops right. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Could yeah. that possibly be a vision? I mean, could you interpret it that way? I don't I, know, but just say, yeah. maybe it really happened, maybe it was a vision. Yeah. The point still is we don't hear about it ever again in the church. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So why do we see Joseph referred to as her betrothed even before the conception of Christ? If his intent, the intention like from the get-go was for him to be a caretaker. I mean, betrothed does not mean marriage. They are two different things. Right, but isn't it the first? Not necessarily. Oh. They are two separate things. In fact, now in the church, you can get betrothed and not get married. We don't do it, but you can. <laughs> so never ever betrothed. Yes, well, but betrothed requires a divorce. Oh. But, but a betrothal is not a marriage. Even in the church nowadays, they are two separate things. In, 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 so, Jewish, in Jewish law at this time, um, she's going to be a woman. And she needs a protector. She right. Needs someone who can legally speak for her, um, can say, yes, this is your family. Um, we watch out for you. If she gets married, well, then she moves on to that. Mm -hmm. But if she were never to marry, she needs to have an older relative who's going to watch out for her and protect her within the legal tradition of that time. So you could be betrothed. She could have been betrothed to Joseph, and then he finishes her upbringing, and then she would get married to someone else if this weren't actually the context of like it's marriage. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% in how it works with, you know, um, the temple virgins. Like if he was just responsible for her until yeah. she became more mature and that she could care for herself. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Well, until her husband can marry and then take care of her. Right. Or did they get married? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there were temple virgins who would later in life become married. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Because, because referencing scripture, right? Like, in scripture it says they're betrothed. Oh, yeah. Like, like, yeah, and then, I mean, I, I think of, um, you know, Anna the prophetess. So Anna the prophetess was a temple virgin of advanced age. So maybe there were just the temple virgins who always lived in the temple and took care of the temple. Was it a predecessor of Eve and Adam? I, I think there, there are, yeah, there's, there are a lot of similarities there. I'm thrown off about the, when she gets to 13, 
the vibe I got is like this is not appropriate anymore to have teenage right. girls around in there's like too many guys trying to be holy around here. You have to leave. I mean, but they said like, who are we? What does that say about her? It was because. They say, what are we going to do? Unclean. Be un, like, make it unclean around here? Yeah, so, so there, there's a strong sense of, uh, of uncleanliness associated with menstruation. Mm. So as, as soon as a woman would have begun menstruating, she would not have been able to serve directly in a specific role in the temple. So that's kind of like the, the, the association that happens there. So as soon as she – now maybe on that side of temptation, you know, for the men there. Yeah. But it, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it has a, a, a closer tie to the, the physical maturity and then menstruation that's uh, – to Yeah, because they would be unclean right. in the so temple. there would be no woman of menstruating age in the temple as a temple virgin. Correct. So I don't know like what the – Up until menstruation and then menopause. You know, I, I I hadn't thought about that, but I, I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Why like Anna and what she was and, you know, this this whole period of time. So, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. But did you have a question? Um, I he answered it about the, uh, the, the I was just wondering kind of what the betrothed. Oh, yeah. It is more, yeah, it is more like guardian. And, and so I was saying this about like the Orthodox wedding. When you exchange your rings, right, in the Orthodox marriage service, this is the service of betrothal. And this was often done days, months, years before you were married. It's a, it's a, it's a promising to care for the other person. Now, the, the downsides of betrothal, it's all of the responsibility without any of the benefits, that's what it means. It's all the responsibility with none of the benefits. Um, so if someone was betrothed, and this is why it makes me question about her getting married, they wouldn't, they, they'd have to go through a divorce. So if you're betrothed to somebody, you'd have to get divorced to the person, like if you wanted to move on. So I, I, I wish I knew a little bit more about like what the Jewish pr- practice of betrothal was. But in, in the Orthodox church, if you get betrothed, and you decide to break it off. It's not just like a breaking off of an engagement. It's a divorce. Um, not as a serious a divorce as a marriage, but it's still considered like an ecclesiastical divorce. Which is probably why the betrothal ceremony is in the same that's ex- thing. That's, that's, the, that is exactly why. They, they were, because of that issue, they were like, we don't want this to be a problem. And they put them right next to each other. Paul, that's exactly why. We can. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, how young could women get married in I would, I would think right when they're physically mature. I mean, we're, we're right around here at 13 or so. Um, yeah. Yeah, very early on. Okay. So just okay. to clarify further, it sounds like their, the guardianship is different from engagement, and engagement is different from betrothal. Yeah, I, well, I don't know if there's association with, like, an engagement in the Old Testament. I mean, we have that now. I think that's a newer thing, uh, engagement. In our day, engagement and betrothal are different. It's, right. It's, like you said, it's, you have to get divorced if you're betrothed. Right, betrothed. right. But it yeah. sounds like back then, I don't know, was betrothal more the guardian? Or I think it was more the guardian. I, and I wish I, I knew a little... Yeah, I think I think it does have a different connotation. Now, I'm sure it happened that someone was betrothed to someone and they cared for them until they got older and then they got married to them. I don't doubt that that happened. Um, but in this context, she was betrothed to Joseph and that was it. Never married to Joseph. And I guess just to take that further, I'm just thinking what Emily said at the beginning. Um, you know, in the Protestant upbringing, they were engaged. You know, that's, that's what I learned. They right. were engaged. And so they were near the same age, and we didn't know any of this stuff. But hey, does that make sense? You know, it's like, so. Right. So that, it's not engagement, but we're learning, you know, well, it didn't necessarily mean that she was 12 or whatever. Yeah, 12, 12 when and she leaves the temple. Joseph's uh, guardian. Yep, and he already had adult children, yeah. basically. Anyway, that just yeah. helps me, too. Yeah. 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 It wasn't as read as engagement within, like, the American process. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You don't have a context for betrothal. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No one knows what to do with that. No, I mean, yeah. Well, really especially mean, because of what the word means in a modern context, uh-huh. too. Right. Just, that's what I'm trying to say. It just yeah. it, it didn't mean engagement like we would. 
think or how I used to think, you know, yeah. when, before I became orphan. Right. I'm actually going to look up the word betrothal in Greek to see what it is. Um, okay, so we have we now have the the nativity narrative of uh, a Christ being born in a cave. Again, this is the reference of uh, Christ being born in a cave, and through all this, we also have a story of a midwife that appears. Right, you don't ever see those in the crash scenes where there's a midwife. And uh, this midwife is very, very surprised about this whole experience, about you know this uh, how this birth happens. And there's this awkward little interchange that happens here. So she doesn't believe kind of this, um, uh, you know, this whole thing that's going on. They seem to know the story a little bit of Mary and Joseph, right? That, that she was pregnant without, uh, you know, uh, knowing, knowing a man, basically. And, and so this midwife, Salome, is so doubtful about it. It says, there is no small contention concerning you. And this line, I would say, there is no small contention concerning you, is every person who's reading this text question. Right? Everybody is wondering when they're reading this text, who is this Mary person? Right? So this whole thing is really like summarized in that one little line. There is no small contention concerning you. And in order to address this, she puts her finger forward and tests her condition. So, I mean, I don't mean to say this crudely, but she's she's testing whether uh, she's intact, right? In other words, is she still a virgin? So she's physically testing to see if she's still a virgin. And uh, as she does so, um, (laughs) what happens? She loses her hand. Right? We talked about this last week, remember? When there's the other person who tries to reach out and touch the beer of Mary, her funeral beer, the, the, the guy's hands get chopped off. Well, here something similar happens. Because who is Mary? She is the ark. And what happened in the Old Testament when somebody touched the ark? They were struck down. So something similar happens here, essentially. This midwife loses her hand. And realizes, woe for my wickedness and my unbelief, for I have tempted the living God, and behold, my hand falls away from me and is consumed by fire. And then she prays uh, to the God of my fathers, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then at the end of her prayer, uh, her angel, uh, or sorry, uh, her hand is restored to her. Okay, so after this doubt, her hand is restored. Andrew? I was just going to ask if she would have. Yeah, well, her hand comes back, so, um, yeah, so an angel of the Lord stands and, and says to her, Salome, God, the Lord has heard your prayer, stretch out your hand to the child and touch him. So who heals the midwife? Christ, right? So he restores, uh, he restores her hand. So um, as we kind of come to the end of this uh, a story here, I want to bring up kind of one, a couple of one uh, last things here. Um, so we have, we have these, these interactions. We have this story of uh, Elizabeth and John the Baptist who, who wind up uh, go uh, hiding when Herod sends out the soldiers to kill all the children. And there are actually icons of this, that the mountains swallow them up, right, as they're running away. Uh, so that they won't be killed by uh, the soldiers that are going to kill all the youth. So, so the, you might see some icons, and it'll be like Mary, uh, Elizabeth and um, uh, John the Baptist as an infant, and they're kind of surrounded by a mountain. So that's this imagery that we see here. Uh, because Joseph, or, or John the Baptist was, of course, you know, just a few months old when Christ was born, so he was in that age range that, that Herod would have um, you know, killed the children. And then uh, Zacharias, of course, is, uh, is killed. And that was because he would not. Yeah, he wouldn't. The... Correct. Yep. And sent officers to Zacharias at the altar to ask him, where have you hidden your son? So he, wasn't, he wouldn't give up his children, his son. So they killed Zacharias in the temple. And so we, we know this, this verse from Scripture as well, that Zacharias is slain at the altar. And then... 
And we'll finish up here. This is the end of the, the narrative. The lot falls to Simeon. And for Simeon, we know uh, this line that Christ is presented in the temple as according to Jewish custom when he was 40 days old. And it would be revealed to uh, him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death until he had seen uh, Christ in the flesh. Now, this is a pretty interesting uh, little line here. And there's a little bit of a tradition uh, surrounding this that I, I, uh, I want to share with you. And we'll, we'll finish it up on, on, on these, this little story of Simeon. But the, the most common text that was read by Jews at this time. Anybody know what it would have been? The most common text of the Bible that people would have been reading. Like Job was real popular. Job, yeah, sorry, that, this, yeah, what, what version of the Old Testament would most people have been reading? Now, that's just a broad term, Septuagint. The Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek text translated from the Hebrew. Most people were, were reading Greek. In fact, uh, Christ, on his way up to the cross, was most likely uh, reciting Psalm 23 in Greek, not in Hebrew. Or, so it, it was very likely that, that people were, would know these texts in the Greek in the first century. Okay? And so the Septuagint is a 2nd century B.C. translation of the Hebrew Bible. And it's called the Septuagint because there were 70 scholars that were involved in the translation of the Old Testament. And there's this verse uh, in Isaiah that we've brought up before that says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, let's say a, a tradition of the church is that the person who translated this text was, in fact, Simeon. So Simeon was one of the 70. And he was the one who translated this text, and he didn't believe this line. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So he didn't, he didn't believe this text. He translated it anyway. And um, basically what happens in his disbelief, God says to him, not only will you believe it, but you will see the fruition of this prophecy. So that's the point at which Simeon is told that you will survive in order to see this prophecy come true. So that's where that line in the New Testament that says it has been revealed by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death. I mean, it, yeah, well, it, it seems like kind of out of place. Like, why? I mean, was he around for just 50 years? But in fact, again, tradition of the church, this isn't, you know, dogma of the church, but, but tradition in the life of the church is that he was one of the translators uh, of the <laughs> Old Testament, and he would, see, he would see Christ born of a virgin. And then back into, into Luke now, we have this line. Now, uh, these few verses. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And does anybody know what Simeon means? Shalom. You have heard of me by suffering. Did you just make that up? No, it's uh, from the verb Shema. Like Shema, my cry, Lord. Oh. His mother said... I asked for a child, or my husband didn't love me, and uh -huh. she cries out to the Lord to give him a child, because I'll make him shamon, but you have heard my suffering. Interesting. Well, in Greek, the word simian means sign. Simiosi is sign. Uh, so I I'd be interested to see what the connection is with the, with the Hebrew in there. Um, but, oh, I like that. That's, That's good. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Greek, at least, Simeon means sign. And we have this uh, verse, again, from Isaiah, shall give you a sign. So it's directly referencing Simeon, who would be seeing this sign. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple, and when the parents brought, him, brought in the, G, the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. 
For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and glory to thy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce your own soul also that thoughts out of many hearts and that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. So again, uh, the sign is Jesus Christ and uh, Simeon who you know, translates this, this verse from Isaiah, is given the opportunity to see this uh, prophecy fulfilled. Uh, so I, I love that connection, uh, too. And then that basically takes us to the end of the Proto-Evangelium of James. So a lot going on in there. Um, this reading, you know, bears a, a lot of consideration and, and rereading, I think, you know, many times. Um, again, within, within the context of the life of the church, the hymnography, the liturgical life of the church, uh, etc. But So according to this, Christ wasn't born naturally. He just teleported? No, 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 no. We so believe he was born naturally, yeah. But is her, that, her virginity pain? is intact. Without pain. Okay. Without pain. And, yeah, I mean, what's the explanation? We don't know. But, with, but there without great, pain, there was right. There light and then the child was there. It's a, it's like, yeah, it's like... Right, right. So just, I think says until, he, appeared, until the child appeared. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, and, and then blah 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 cut scene. Yeah, yeah. I, I think no. I think you know there's a little bit of like a. Um, it, it, I, I think they you know they would want to cloak that aspect of it and just like okay. you know some um, well, later, modesty. Like, with the physical testing. Right, like, right. Like that would be possible. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So that, yep. I was like, did he just appear? Yeah. Yep. It wasn't very clear. No, and it's not it's not it's, it's not, not really dogma. clear. Yeah, again, not dogma. I mean her hymen stays intact. What does that mean? You know, we don't we don't delve into those those kinds of things. The it's just uh putting this all into the narrative of this was a miraculous birth. Okay? Uh that there's something distinct and different about it than every other birth. Uh so I they think that's the that's kind of the highlight of what, what's trying to be said in those few verses. But it, it, it kind of makes me think of like one of those things where it's like hundred percent human, hundred percent God. It like kind of doesn't make logical sense, but you just kind of have to take it. Right, it right, right. And and I would I would be hesitant to just be like, oh yes, her hymen was intact, and therefore okay, this is. I mean that it does. Well, it kind of does. It, I mean, it doesn't use the word, it doesn't say hymen, but it says she put her tested. hand in her and tested. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's... She's in trouble for checking. It's, it doesn't yeah. say <laughs> it was intact. It, was like, it does say it touch, she touched her. Yeah. It is, I mean, uh, honestly, like for a second century text, it's a, little, it's a little graphic. And she put forward her finger to test her condition. And she cried out saying, um, yeah. I'm just saying it doesn't say the condition. And the condition was verified. Right, 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 yeah. But she says, well, for my, my unbelief, you can yeah. take that as being like, well, right. oh, I should have believed you. Yeah, 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 yep. And that our womb was holy, that's what I take from that. The ark was uh, holy. I, that's, the, that's the connection that should be taken, yeah, yeah. That right. she is the ark and she right. touches the ark. So holy. Right. And then the, the womb was holy. Right, yeah. Contain Contain God, right. The, yeah. The Greek um, is uh, for betrothed is I don't know nestuo m n e s t e u o was a uh, from the Strong's. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, anyway, it doesn't. It wasn't. Maybe you can find some yeah. resources on it because yeah. it was like it, they said espoused. Uh huh. Uh huh. They were like, okay, it's Hebrew, it says Hebrew verb aras translated to nestuo in Greek. Espoused. Okay. They, well, I'll, like, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely look in a. All right. Well, uh, I will send out another reading. Nice. And again, not, not next week, but I think in two weeks. I even forgot what we we're going to talk about in two weeks. <laughs> we'll look at your summer. Just. Yeah. Was it Was Annunciation it or? Annunciation. Yeah. 
That sounds right. I think I, think I wanted to uh, lump Annunciation and Dormition into that. And I'm going to send out a, a reading of a, uh, a sermon by Proclus of Constantinople. April 14th, Annunciation. There we go. So we'll talk about Annunciation and Dormition. I kind of want to see if I can get a little slideshow going. Uh, because all of this story of the Annunciation that happens in the Proto-Evangelium is all iconog- iconographically depicted in many, 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 many instances. And I've got a, n- a nice little slideshow that uh, a teacher put together. And so I kind of want to do that in conjunction with, with um, uh, this discussion as well. Because, I mean, you know, thousand-year-old iconography that depicts all of these events. So it's really, it's, uh, I think it's an, an, a nice way to experience it as well. We talk so much about how important the liturgical life of the church is and how these traditions are emphasized through, through liturgy, through hymnography. And I think it's great to look at things in that context as well. All right. Thank you very much.